Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IEP2 USA's special webinar on, professional on the Professional Certification Program. It's with pleasure uh, that I get to invite you to Wendy uh, Greenlow, who is the chair of the Certification Task Force. My name is Amelia Shaw, and I'm the executive manager of IAP USA, and I will be your moderator today. But basically, this is Wendy's, Wendy's show, uh, and and really yours as well. We want you to be able to ask the, any questions that you might have with respect to certification. So please raise your hand, send me a question in a question box, or, or put it into the chat so that we truly are responding to questions you may have regarding certification. So with that, Wendy, I'm actually going to turn it over to you, and you can take us from here. Thanks, Amelia. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who's on the webinar today. Um, as Amelia explained, I've um, for the last couple of years, I've been chairing a task that was convened by IAP2 USA to develop a proposal for a professional certification program. And the task force has been in 2013. Um, we're pleased to announce that we'll host two assessment centers in 2016. Um, we had a pilot for the program in 2015. Um, we uh, assessment center the day after the conference ended in um, the Portland. And based on the many lessons that we learned from the pilot, we've refined the program and we're ready to roll in 2016. So just to give you a little Quick more bit of background. Um, the IAP2 Federation um, gave IAP2 USA permission to proceed with developing this program as a pilot for the um, Federation. And, and we've had um, the task force has seven members. We have representation from IAP2 Canada and from IAP2 Southern Africa on the task force. Um, and so we've been working, like I said, since 2013 to um, develop a program. The, the idea being that um, the, the result of our efforts could be used by the other affiliates in defining their own programs. So with that, um, oops, well, can I move forward? No. There I can. Okay. So in 2015, we had a pilot. Um, it was, we were lucky enough to, to um, get three brave souls that were willing to be guinea pigs, and they attended the pilot. Um, also lucky for us, it turns out that they were highly qualified, and all three were awarded the Master's Cer Certified Public Participation Professional Level of Certification. Um, we've been hard at work since that pilot trying to make sure we capture all the lessons we learned and develop the final program design. So in 2016, we intend to conduct two assessment centers. One will be on June 24th and the second will be on September 9th. The locations have not yet been determined yet. We will be um, picking those in part based on who applies to attend the programs so we can minimize travel for everyone. Um, I do want to point out that we'll need an adequate number of candidates to run they don't end up losing money for the organization. So um, this presentation is designed to tell you enough about the program that you could um, seek to apply and there's three sets of numbers that I want to make sure everybody understands. There are two levels that have been defined for the professional certification program. There's the certified public participation professional, and this is um, composed of all of the essential skills that I believe are necessary for an individual to um, be certified. And then there's a master's level that goes above and beyond that certified level with some specialized skills and competencies. Um, in order to determine whether someone is eligible for certification, we have um, devised a three-step assessment process. Step one is the application and portfolio. Step two is a response to a case study. And step three is an assessment center. And I'll be telling you a lot more about this three-step process as we go through the presentation today. So, Wendy. And the... Um, 
Yes. Hi, Wendy. I'm just going to interrupt for just a second because we've had a few more people join us on the line, uh, and I just want to oh. welcome the other people that okay. have joined us. Um, but we did have a question from Cassie. You mentioned adequate, um, and she was just wondering what you mean by adequate. Oh, did I use the word adequate? I think the essential. Um, and so this, I, I assume this question relates to the CP3 level. These are the essential skills that um, are required for someone to be a professional in our field. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we identified the what what is essential in a few moments. Does, I hope that answers the question. Actually, that was my fault. She was actually. Sorry, I used the word. No, it was it was the number of people. It was the previous slide. The number of people that must oh, be adequate. Okay. Yeah. Well, the um, for this year we need six for the June assessment center, and we need nine for the September assessment center. Um, eventually, we hope that this program will be um, generate revenue for the organization. But in this um, 2016, we'll be able to run at a slightly lower level of um, number of people. But we, we don't want to drop below that because we don't want um, IEP2 money. So I hope that answers it. Thanks, Wendy. So the, the, last, the last point on five core competencies that form the basis for the assessment processes. And like I explained, I'm going to be going over these things in more depth as the presentation goes on. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit more about is the core competencies. Um, they were developed in consultation with members um, from around the world. We had over 100 people participate in an initial survey, and then we took all the input that we got and we massaged them into the five areas of core competencies. We put those core competencies out for um, uh, for professionals in the field to respond to. And so we're, we feel pretty good that these are the core competencies that were defined by practitioners in the field. So the first one is, I, is P2 process design and application. And these are the skills that are needed to a um, public participation program. To design. The second is P2 design and conduction, and these are the skills that are needed to design and implement a specific event within an overall P2 program. The third is appropriate use of tools and techniques, and these are the school skills that um, we have available to us, and it's about how we go about choosing and using tools and techniques so that they're well suited to accomplish the event, um, the objectives of an event. Then P2 communication skills, skills that we need to effectively communicate in order to support public participation. And then finally, P2 people skills. And these are the people skills that are needed by professionals in our field. So um, next I'll give you a little overview of the certification process and then we'll dig into the details on that. So, for certification, there are three steps, all of which are designed to look for evidence of a candidate's knowledge and skills in the five core competencies. The three steps in the process are submit an application and portfolio, then second is to prepare a response to a case study, and then third is to participate, participate in an assessment center. Um, the application is designed to tell us what you've done in the past and to provide evidence of, of your past experiences. And the case study is designed to allow candidates to provide evidence that they can perform um, against the core competencies in a hypothetical scenario. And then the assessment center is designed to allow assessors to observe the candidates looking at, for evidence of a few things that we didn't think were possible to assess using the application or the case study. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out is um, the assessor's job is to core competencies throughout the entire process. We have some ideas about when that evidence will present itself, but um, if a, an applicant is interested in seeking um, certification, we would like to suggest to you that those successful candidates are those that become thoroughly familiar with the core competencies and take advantage of this process 
as an opportunity to demonstrate their ability to perform according to the core competencies. Um, next, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, two levels of certification. The certified public professional, I'm sorry, are um, those people that have all of the essential skills that are required um, of professionals. We think it's an entire suite of skills that are good work in our profession. And the master's level is um, for those people that are most experienced and qualified, and it would include skills that they would be expected to pick up over the years in the business. The certification process is designed to assess both levels of professionals side by side at the same assessment center. And the assessors are, it's not a competition, so we're not judging people against each other. Everyone is being evaluated against the five core competencies. Um, one of our um, successful MCP3 um, folks um, volunteered to de design a, um, a diagram of the process for us, and we were grateful <laughs> because it's kind of hard to explain what we what we're doing. So um, Stephen Wolf um, developed this this diagram. The boxes across the bottom are the steps in the process and then the circles represent what it is that we're looking at. Um, I should probably also explain that there's a prerequisite thinking certification is that candidates should have completed the IAP2 Foundations program. This is the five-day training renamed from the certificate program, but it's the five days of training that IEP2 has conducted since 1999, and that's a prerequisite for seeking certification. So the second, or the first step in the process is to submit an application. Well, I'll tell you more about both of those in a minute, but that's to screen applicants to make sure that they have um, they can demonstrate that they're going to be successful in being assessed. We didn't want to invite people to the more rigorous submission of a case study and participate at the assessment um, center if they weren't ready yet. So if an application and portfolio doesn't provide adequate evidence that they're going to be successful, then we would um, ask the candidate to come back in a couple of years and, and seek to continue developing their skills. If they are, if we do think that they're going to be successful, then we'll um, provide them with a case study, and the case study provides an opportunity for them to demonstrate their knowledge and skills um, in a hypothetical scenario. And then they'll be invited to attend an assessment center, and the assessment center is designed to um, allow candidates to demonstrate the skills that can only really be observed, I mean measured through direct observation. Um, there's also an interview at the assessment center and that provides an additional opportunity for, for the assessors to fill in some gaps if we've got any in, in the evidence that people have provided. So I will come back to this um, diagram again and later in the um, presentation and open up for questions to see if, if people are getting what we're talking about. So Wendy, um, there, so, Wendy, there yeah. are there are a couple of questions. Um, it's, so one of okay, them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one of them is why do I have to complete the foundations training? And as a follow up, can I be certified if I haven't completed the training? So why do I have to do the foundations training? And can I be certified if I haven't completed the training? Um. Program covers the material that IEP2 believes is most essential for a practitioner in our field. Um, and we felt that most professional certification programs um, for other professions, you know, engineering and architecture and planning, have an academic home. And we don't have that, that academic home. So when we were searching for what would provide the um, an appropriate knowledge base for the professional certification program, the most obvious answer was the foundations program. It is a prerequisite. We do anticipate in the future offering a possibility of a test in lieu of the course, but it does not yet exist. So at the present time, it is an essential prerequisite. Did I answer both of those questions? 
Sorry, Wendy. Uh, Wendy, I, th I think the other one was, uh, can I be certified if I haven't completed the training? And given that training is a prerequisite, I presume the answer is no. You actually have to have the training before you can even start the certification process. At the, at the present time, that is correct. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I want to delve a little deeper in the core competencies. Um, process design and application covers a lot of territory. So um, based on the input that we got from members, um, we identified specific criteria that allow us to evaluate performance against the, um, uh, against the core competencies. There's 13 criteria for P2 process design and application, seven for event planning and implementation, six for appropriate use of tools and techniques, eight for communication, and then one for people skills. Don't misinterpret that they are um, the weighting. All of all of the core comp all of the criteria that are identified for the CP3 level are essential. So none of them can be waived. Um, so in other words, P2 process design is not necessarily more important than people skills. Um, now, they are not, we, there's 35 total distinct criteria. 31 of them find at the CP3 level and each of them are essential for certification. There are 24, and I know these numbers don't add up, so don't, ex <laughs> don't expect them to, and I'll explain that further in a minute. But there are 24 that have been defined at the master's level. And only two-thirds of those 24 are necessary for someone to get um, master level certification. The thinking is that um, when people have been in the business for a long time, they become specialized. So some of the master's um, criteria are uh, more specialized. So I'm going to try to explain this in the next two slides. Um, the core competencies are available. There's a matrix of core competencies, and they are available on the website and these I've got two excerpts from the core competencies to give you a little orientation here this is the top of um, core competency 1.0 which is the P2 process planning and application skills the rows are there's one row for each criteria in this case I'm presenting 1.1 which is the ability to work with a sponsor to understand the decision to be made the decision-making process, and what role the public might play in the decision-making process. The next piece of information, there's three columns that indicate or share with you where we anticipate being able to find evidence. So we anticipate being able to find evidence of this criteria on the application in the case study. It doesn't mean that we won't see something at the assessment center, but that's just where we anticipate finding it criteria, we have defined this for both CP3 and MCP3 level. So we expect to see that the candidate is able to work with a sponsor to develop a full understanding of the decision to be made, the decision-making process, and how the public input might improve the decision. If the candidate is unable to demonstrate that ability, they will we will not be able to give them a score. So the inadequate column describes what level of um, what we would be expecting to find in someone that's not ready yet for certification. I'd, I have two more um, criteria for, for discussion purposes today. The second one is 1.2, and this is the ability to define with a sponsor clear objectives for involving the public in the entire decision-making process. At the CP3 level, or the essential level, candidates are able to establish objectives for involving the public that are consistent with the se selected level of the spectrum in support of the decision-making process. But for master's level folks, we are expecting that they would also be able to identify objectives that are sm specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-oriented and that those objectives would span the entire decision-making process. So there's two different levels. In this case, you, 
um, I hope this is starting to help you understand how there's 31 essential criteria and 20 criteria for the master's level. So in this case, we'd be looking at a candidate and discerning which level they are performing at. And then the third example is 1.13, which is the ability to analyze and share lessons learned from the P2 process with the sponsor. In this case, we don't believe that this is essential, that not all um, CP3s would be able to do this, and so we will only be looking for evidence for those folks that we think are eligible for the master's level. I hope, um, so I'm sorry, I'm just trying to catch up with my help here in my pages. So. Um, now, how to go about the process. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the application process now. Um, the application is online, and um, um, people that are interested in applying can go online and fill out the application. It, in some ways, is a little bit similar to an, a job application. It, it asks for some standardized information like education and job history. We ask folks to let us know if they have other certifications or memberships or relevant accomplishments. Um, we have a question about why are you interested in seeking certification. Um, we want that evidence that oh, we talked about a minute ago that you've taken the training. Um, there's a request for three references. And then there's a matrix of um, P2 techniques in the techniques course. Um, and this is an opportunity for candidates to indicate the level of experience and techniques they've used and at what levels of the spectrum. Um, this next page is a screenshot from the P2 techniques. This matrix, um, people will be able to check off which techniques they've used in the past, give us a name of a project where that technique was used, indicate their role on the project, and then what level of the spectrum project was, or that technique was used at. So that's what that techniques table looks like. The second piece of the application is project descriptions. Um, each candidate it will be um, provided within um, 750 words. We'll be asking for folks to provide an overall description of the program and the role they played in it, what the objectives for the P2 process were, the level of the spectrum, and the rationale for that level of the spectrum, and then and what the rationale was for those techniques that were chosen. So the next slide presents a, a bit of a screenshot from the application to give you a sense of what the project descriptions look like. Um, call your attention to about halfway down the page. It says describe the objectives of the P2 process for this project and how they were defined. This correlates with criteria 1.2, so we've given some hints on the project descriptions of why we're asking for that information. So if you look at the core competencies table and then you look at the application, you can start to get a picture for where we'll be looking for evidence. There are a number of questions that are not specific to those three project descriptions that we want to that we need to ask, um, and so project in your experience in answering these these questions. This is just three from, from the uh, um, application. And then the last part of the application that I want to explain is a portfolio. And the portfolio is composed of work samples that you can use to document your prior work and how that experience relates to the core competencies. Um, once you've completed the um, matrix of techniques and you've submitted your project descriptions, we want you to take a good deep breath and look at the breadth of your experiences to date and figure out where you need to provide additional documentation of your um, capabilities according to the core competencies. And so you're welcome to attach up to 10 pieces to your application that document your prior work. They could be videos, it could be a um, manual that you developed, it could be a report. So it's up to you to decide which 10, up to 10 pieces you think would best um, 
fill out your application to demonstrate your experience. And this is a picture of what this part of the application looks like. The box that says piece one, what, you're not putting your piece in the box. What you're doing is you're describing what that piece is and why you're submitting it. If you're submitting, um, you, you want to provide additional evidence of your ability to tailor um, communication products for an audience's needs. You would explain in this piece why this specific um, information product has been attached. So, once you've submitted your application and um, it's accepted by the assessors as being an ad providing adequate evidence that you're ready for the certification assessment, then you'll be provided with a case study. And the case study is a hypothetical case. Um, what, what you'll do is read the case study, and then you'll have an opportunity to meet her who can answer questions about the project. And then based on the information that's provided in the written case study and your the project sponsor, you'll have the opportunity to um, prepare a response, which is a um, a description of what you would propose as the public participation program and submit your proposal for evaluation by the assessors and then assessors and hopefully an invitation to attend the upcoming assessment center again if if there's if the case study looks like you're really not ready yet that could be an outcome get invited to attend the assessment center this next page is our next slide is just um, lopped off the top of the case study assignment to give you a sense about what it looks like. Um, the steps in the process include reviewing the case study, make sure you're thoroughly familiar with the case study and the core competencies, and then schedule a telephone interview with a project sponsor where you're provided an opportunity to ask questions to fill in the gaps around what, what you need to know to be able to design um, the P2 plan, and then this third step is to develop the public participation plan for submission. So the third step in the assessment process is to attend an assessment center. Um, and on this slide, we've provided a little bit of information about what the agenda for the assessment center looks like. There's an opportunity for a private interview with an assessor. Um, the evening or afternoon before the assessment center, and this is just designed to help fill in any gaps. If they have any questions about the material you've submitted so far, they'll ask you questions in that interview, you know, again, trying to find evidence that you have the core competencies. Then at the assessment center itself, each candidate will have a 20-minute presentation. Um, the, what the assessors will tell you what we want you to present, and then you'll have an opportunity to get um, ask questions by the assessors. Then all the candidates will be divided into teams of three and presented with a typical challenge that could come up in a public participation effort. And the teams will have one hour to prepare their response. And then they have 20 minutes to present their response, followed by questions and answers. And then at the very end of the day, there's a 15-minute a private interview with the entire panel of assessors. So it's a very full day. Um, then after the assessment center, um, each candidate is provided detailed feedback on their entire package and successful candidates are asked to sign a pledge and I'll show you that pledge in a minute and then they'll receive a copy of their certification for framing and putting on the wall and bragging about. Um, there are some ongoing certification requirements and recertification requirements um, I'm not going to go into those on this call, but the details of both frequently asked questions that's posted on the IAP2 USA website for certification. So this next um, slide has the pledge. Um, we wanted to seal this certification with a commitment to word in practicing. Um, in full compliance with what IEP2 is about. So we ask candidates to say, make a commitment that they'll actively engage and support IEP2 in its mission, that they'll conduct public participation work that's values-based, decision-oriented, and goal-driven. That's um, part of the foundation's training. 
um, that they'll practice the core competencies in their work going forward, that they'll continuously expand their knowledge and skills, that they'll practice self-awareness and conduct themselves at all times with personal national integrity, in, um, informed by the core, co core values and the code of ethics, that they'll serve as mentors and coaches for other practitioners, and then lastly, that they'll advocate for public participation as a part of good governance and sound decision making. So once a candidate has signed the pledge, then they will receive um, the certification um, in the mail, and it's signed by the president of IUSA and has a date for when it was awarded. I keep getting behind on my pages, I'm sorry. Turn to the diagram one more time and um, oper open it up to see if the criteria and the core competencies don't make sense or if the process doesn't make sense. So do you have questions? Hi, Wendy. Yes, I've got a funny about yep. There's, yeah. there's a few questions, so I'm just going to go through them as I've received them. So um, let me just get back up to the first one. So the first one was asking, um, why don't you just give us a test for the core competencies? Why this great big process? Um, when we did our research into what professional certification entails, uh, most programs require require uh, verification of capability of performance against um, standards that have been established by the profession. And um, I think the task force just did not feel that it was appropriate to um, validate capability of performing against all the core competencies. We didn't make the core competencies up. I'd remind you that they came to us from membership and you know the people skills is a good example. Um, we, we got a of, of input from members that that for people to be eligible for certification they need to be authentic, they need to be respectful, they need to be trustworthy. They um, and we don't know a way to test for those skills. So um, that's really why is in order to to really um, meet what's expected of professional credentialing programs, um, we didn't feel it was appropriate to, to rely simply on a test. Thanks very much. So uh, the next question um, from Brenda, could I get a master's designation with only five years experience in the field or is it for 10 plus years of experience? Well, we really grappled with the number of years of experience. And in reality, in this field, there's a lot of us that do it about 5%. People do it 100% of their time for a short period of time. And we decided that years of experience wasn't really a reliable mechanism for measuring against the core competencies. We're really looking at whether someone can meet the quality standards at the master's level. And um, again, we're not expecting that very many people would get all 24 points at the master's level because most of us are specialized in some way. So we, we, we set the bar at, at two-thirds. So for 16 um, of the master's credits, you're eligible. And it's, you know, if you can do it in five years, good on you. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so a question about money. Um, why is it so expensive and who gets the money? Well, I actually haven't talked about the money yet, but I will move to that slide really quick. Um, the application fee, we, we split the costs into two pieces, the application fee and the assessment fee. And our rationale for this was we didn't want someone to have to commit to the whole um, cost until we were reasonably sure they were going to be successful. In order to review, the charge is $300. And then to participate in the assessment, which includes the case study and the assessment center, is $29.25. Um, I explained 
explained that we went through a pilot last year, and um, part of the pilot was to figure out how much work it was to conduct the assessment. And the assessors have a very tall job description. They have to review the applications, they have to review the case studies, they have to design and conduct the assessment centers. And so the fee was established to make sure that IEP2 USA does not lose money in going through the process because we have to pay the assessors. Um, the money goes to IEP2 USA. This is a program that was developed by our affiliate. It does not go to the Federation. It just goes to the affiliate. Um, I think over time we may decide that, that the fee levels are not appropriate. We're reasonably sure that they are based on the experience of one year. But um, certainly that is something that will get revisited on a periodic basis. Um, and there, it's expensive because it's time consuming on the part of assessors to do the work that's necessary to confirm or affirm that someone has the competencies. Hope that answered that question. The other thing that is mentioned on this slide is the fees can be paid online and both of them are non-refundable. Did you have more questions, Amelia? No, that's it at the moment. I think, uh, oh, uh, there was just a quick question. Is there reciprocity with IEP2 Canada? Well, that is being discussed and um, we have a, a task force member that is on the phone today from Canada. She is a member of the I Would you like to answer that question? So I'll, I'll open up Brenda's mic in just a second, but there was another follow-up question regarding the, the money um, and just wondering uh, if it was refundable if somebody didn't pass. So if given that they have to pay in advance for the assessment center, what happens if they don't pass? Okay, we are not selling certification. So no, it's not refundable. Um, that's one reason why we separated the application from the certification process. We want to be reasonably successful before we collect that assessment fee. Um, this is something we still need to iron out. It's my expectation that it's your tough luck, sorry, so sad, goodbye, but more that we'll invite you back um, for a future assessment center or perhaps there might be some remedial steps that could be established with the assessors for how to fill in gaps. Um, but no, it's not, you're not purchasing certification, you are paying for the service of being assessed. And so since you've been assessed, we cannot refund the money. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. I'm just going to open up Brenda's mic. Uh, Brenda, there was a, a, a quick question about is there reciprocity with IAP2 Canada? Just wondering if you wanted to respond to that. Um, we had, uh, before the pilot, which was in Portland in September, we had gone to the IAP2 Canada board and asked for reciprocity and they did agree that we would go ahead with that. That being said, at this point in time, we have struck a, a Canadian task force that is looking at all of the work that's been done by USA um, IAP2. And there are just a few changes that we're going to, to need to, to fit it into our Canadian context. Um, and so, in short, yes, there will be reciprocity, but there will be um, a few caveats around just a few core competencies that are missing for, for the U.S. that we want to see for our Canadian practitioners. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you for your response. Uh, Wendy, back over to you. Okay, well, I have one more slide, um, which presents the, um, well, I have a couple more slides, but this one I want to present, which is the dates for 2016. Um, the application period is open right now. In fact, it's open from now on. You can apply any time. Um, those applications that are received by March 17th will be evaluated as a batch um, for the possibility of the June um, assessment center and those that are received by May 26th will become eligible for attending the September Assessment Center. 
Um, the, about two weeks after that, candidates that have been, well, candidates will be notified as to whether their applications are adequate or not. And those that will be attending, or be invited to attend the assessment center will receive their case study assignment about two weeks after that. Candidates will have five weeks to prepare the responses to the case study. And then they will receive final instructions for the, case, for the assessment center between that date and the assessment center. And then the last thing that is portrayed on the slide is we will, um, we're obligated to provide feedback to the folks that attend the, case, the assessment centers by the final dates for each program. I think that's what I needed to say about that. Uh, we will continue to accept after uh, May 26th and they will be put into the for 2017 assessment centers. So, um, Amelia, can you tell me if Stephen has joined us? I'm pleased to let you know that Stephen is on the line. He is. Ah. So, I wanted to um, give Stephen an opportunity. He's um, one of our successful MCP3 candidates. He's from Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm wondering, Stephen, if you have a word of advice for anyone that might be interested in seeking certification, or maybe more than one uh, word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think uh, you know this was was a, a very uh, rigorous process, and, and I do encourage people that, that want to distinguish themselves uh, professionally and in the marketplace to really take a hard look at, at going through this process. Um, I can tell you that once you've made it through it, uh, you know you've done something. And um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I really respected and appreciated about this, and this is something you, you mentioned, Wendy, is the fact that, you know, everything has to be verified. And, and everything really does have to be demonstrated and, and I, I appreciated that rigor and that thorough, thoroughness. And that, that, I think, for some of the people questioning the cost and, and that, um, that's, that's part of what you're getting from this. Um, and, and, and maybe not everybody's going to be able to pass that, that rigorous uh, review. Um, but I, I just I, I appreciate the integrity uh, of the process. And, uh, and I think it, it, it adds value to, to our profession. So, um, I think that's one thing I would say. Um, the 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 other thing um, that's important here, I, I I I jotted down some of the questions that people are asking, the ones I asked myself or asked you all, you know, for the first go around, and then you know, just like the whole thing about the prerequisites. So so for people that don't know me, uh, um, prior to going through this process, I've been doing this, you know, P2 work for over 25 years. And, you know, and I, I over the years, I'd actually sent some of my staff through the, the, the foundation's training, and I've, I've put on various types. And um, so I was even kind of questioning, like, why do I want to take the prerequisites? I, you know, in some ways, I've kind of written a book on it myself. And, and, and I think this is the real point and the value of what IEP2 is doing is there are a lot of people out there that, you know, they do public relations work, they do marketing work, they do advertising work, and they're not a lot necessarily people that have zeroed in on the focus of what IEP2 really is all about. And I, I finally, after being a member of other associations, really found my home. Um, in the sense that this is an organization that really does focus on the very unique things we do that, that you know, some people might mistake as PR. They might mistake as marketing and advertising. And, and I think this exam really shows and helps you prove and, and you go through this process where it adds value to this profession. I mean, we are a distinct profession. Uh, and, and, and sh in many ways should not be confused with PR and some of these other disciplines that are out there. And um, so I think this is worth it in the sense that we can further distinguish our credentials in the marketplace by going through this process, by being a member of the organization. And, and the prereqs, I think the, the last thing I'll say about that that I think is very important, 
that are identified uh, in the IEP2 training and in, you know, in the instruction manuals, and, and there's a vernacular there. And so there were things I was doing that I was not necessarily using in the same terminology as IEP2 would do it. But fundamentally, the practice was exactly the same. And I think if we are going to further distinguish ourselves in the marketplace, that we do have to share a common language. That there does need to be some commonality in there so that we can set ourselves apart from other practitioners out there. And so I, I, I'm, you know, at this point, I want to vigorously defend uh, the prerequisite course, you know, as, as a prerequisite to this process, so that we can uh, speak with a common language to some, some, some practices that we all may be applying, some competencies we may be applying. Um, I'm to the point now where, in fact, on my proposals going after bids, I am very very deliberately, well maybe I didn't do this a year ago, I'm very deliberately now trying to use the, the vernacular and the terminology in a very disciplined way of IP2 because ultimately that adds value to our membership in the association and it adds further value to your certification. So um, I, I think those are some of the things I'd say that you're going to put a lot of time into this. It's not expensive. I felt it was worth every penny because I know how hard uh, the assessors worked uh, um, to to actually work through this process. Um, it, 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 they had a huge time commitment as, as as I did going through the process. So I, I think you know I understand the, the the reason for the cost and and the rigor that went into that. So with that, I'm I'm happy to to answer any questions or provide any other feedback you may have that I can contribute to this this uh, webinar. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, Wendy, back over to you. Okay, so nobody has questions for Stephen, is that right? Well, I don't see any questions for Stephen at the moment, um, although some, okay. people, some people might want okay. to say, so Stephen, how long did all of this actually take you? Because I know there was a considerable amount of time and effort, and I think it's probably important uh, for people to understand how much time and effort is required to do this. But Stephen, I didn't know if you wanted to mention that or if that's okay. something Wendy's going to do. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'll let Steve okay. answer it. Okay, so, and, and, and I don't want anybody to have shock when I say the time that I put into this because I, I would also say that, um, and that's the fun part of being in a pilot, uh, I put in a lot of time, and I think some of based on my own confusion about what I was supposed to be doing, but I'd say all told, filling out the application, uh, that's, a, that's a really beefy application, so I spent a lot of time with that and putting like a portfolio together, then taking the written part of the exam, showing up and, and going through the assessment itself. All told, just studying up and getting everything done and ready to go, I probably put about a hundred, and then I, I don't think the next I think you know they have um, really refined the application material and the process. Hopefully, that process map helps people understand what they're doing and how they're tracking through this process. Um, and and I and I think Wendy would tell you too that when I was trying to get the material that they could validate my experience and, and my competencies with, I probably sent way more than they were looking for because I wasn't sure, you know, what target I was really trying to hit with them. And I could have probably saved myself some time in just sending one thing instead of like five things. So I, I think that, you know, again, part of the reason I spent that much time on this um, is because of the fact that I, I was uncertain about certain things and I probably should have picked up the phone or sent an email and asked for more clarity before I started hitting send and digging through all my files to try to show the demonstration of my experience. There was a, the three people that got the MCP3 were brave souls. <laughs> they really were. <laughs> so, so Stephen, we appreciate them immensely. We sure do. And Stephen, I think just before there was one last question uh, for you specifically. Um, was there one part that was the hardest part, or was it all hard for you? Um. That, that's, that's a really good question. I, I think going into this and, and looking, I, I think you really, anybody interested in this really has to look over that table 
is, is basically outlining what are all these core competencies and skills and things that you're supposed to demonstrate. And, and I think the hardest part is just making sure you get your head around that. What, what, what are the assessors looking for? And you also have to connect the fact that anything that you represent in writing, um, as far as having been there, done that, you also have to show that. Um, so I, I think that was, that was a, 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 I don't know if that was hard, but just getting your head around that was one piece. Um, the other perhaps hard part, I, I guess on one, on one level I felt very confident that, you know, 25 years of doing this kind of work that, that I, I, I really did feel like I knew what I was doing uh, and had been demonstration that I needed to be able to provide to the group. Um, but I, I think it was just trying to make sure I got my head in the right place on perhaps the written exam. I, I felt very comfortable with the oral exam, and I think some people will kind of maybe freak out about having to, you know, appear in person and, and doing, you know, kind of speaking. And it's tough to speak in front of your peers. It's probably easier to talk to people that don't know quite what we do as well as, as we do. Um, but I think the written part was, was really tough in the sense that I was trying to figure out you know, because you're in a role-playing mode, and you know, it's like, how how real do I play the role play here in trying to respond to what I'm supposed to be providing them, and uh, and you know, a kind of a combination of you know, not going over the page count that they're asking you to submit, listening to the point as you can be. So I, I think that's probably where um, I I felt I don't know if it was angst or not, but just trying to make sure I really nailed the written part was was something I really. Uh, spent a lot of time, I guess, concerning myself with and trying to hit that right. Thanks, Stephen. So, Wendy, back over to you. Okay. Well, I'm, I just want to, just in case anybody's confused, Stephen is talking about the written part and the oral part is not exactly. The written part is the response to the case study and then the oral Oral part is the participation in the assessment center, and I, I've been through academia. I do recognize that there's a, a there's a similarity, I guess, to to the processes. Um, it's gone. So, any other questions? We're coming up on our time. Does Hi, anybody Wendy. have no. any more questions? When yeah. You there doesn't appear to be any more questions, so I think just over to you to finish off. Okay. Well, I did want to just, um, in closing, acknowledge the, the work of the um, task force. We've had an amazing, um, over two years now, working together and inter to introduce everybody you know, to a person. From the Canadian affiliate, we have Brenda Pichette, who lives in Ottawa, Canada. And then from the Southern Africa affiliate, Ken Smith. Um, and then in the U.S., we have Deborah Dewar from Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, Tina Geiselbrecht from Austin, Texas. Cassie Hemphill from Missoula, Montana. Hannah Litzenberger from Seattle, Washington. And typo on the slide, Wendy Lowe, who has recently moved to Loveland, Colorado. <laughs> um, so sorry for me being wrong. Um, at any rate, um, the task force is, is continuing to work. We're um, finalizing um, some pol policies and procedures for the program with an expectation that we'll, um, after conducting the two assessment centers in 2016, we'll be handing off the program to staff um, by the end of the year. So thanks to the task force for all the hard work. And thank you for participating today. I hope we've answered any questions you might have about the program, and we hope to see an application from you soon. Thanks very much, Wendy. And yes, I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, please continue to watch the website for more information on the certification uh, program. Uh, IPT USA is very excited that this is up and off the ground, and we're looking forward to welcoming all of you uh, to one of our assessment centers this year. So, Wendy, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, as always, to the task force. And we're going to bring this webinar to a close. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye now.